So let's just start with the, the picture of the quarter and how you're affected by COVID. Uh, clearly, some of your drugs are in strong demand and some of them are in particular demand. Were there any disruptions? Were there any trouble getting supplies to the market to places that needed your drugs? There was a lot of challenges in the first quarter, both in terms of manufacturing, logistics and so on. And I'm really proud about the fact that all our employees did their best to keep supplies up for the nearly 200 million people we serve every day with high quality medicines. We are the biggest supplier of medicines to the United States and also to Europe. And we've actually been able to keep all our facilities safe for our workers, but also fully operational. And that's really the background for the strong results in the, in the first quarter. We also, obviously, there is strong demand for um, hydrochloroquine. Uh, there were obviously respiratory drugs. Were you able to uh, donate and provide all of the drugs that were asked for on, the, on that front? I would say we donated a lot of hydroxychloroquine to the U.S. government and to states in the U.S., but also to other countries in Europe, in Asia, and so on. I'm not saying we uh, sort of donated everything we were asked for, but we made some really big uh, donations and we worked closely also to secure that supplies actually reach the hospital, reach the people that needed it. And we're not just talking about hydroxychloroquine. We're also talking about the medicines used in ICUs. We're talking about respiratory medicines and, and a whole range of products that are relevant in the COVID-19 situation. Car, what about the fact that there have been lots of concerns about hydroxychloroquine and its effect on COVID-19, whether or not it's effective or not? Will you continue to donate them despite the fact that we continue to see these concerns around the world? So uh, let me make it clear, I'm not an expert on the clinical effects of hydroxychloroquine. So I, I probably don't know much more about it than you do. So uh, I see what's in the press of clinical result that comes out. And it's really up to the healthcare professionals and to the regulatory authorities in each country to assess whether they are interested in using this sort of very old uh, drug or not. Mm. So uh, tell us here in the U.S., of course, you do have litigation around your opioid uh, fines. Are you going to see any impact on these litigation timelines, given that the COVID-19 pandemic is raging at the moment? Yes, we've actually seen that already. You probably remember that we reached a framework agreement with uh, the AGs at the end of last year. And then there was a trial uh, that was supposed to start in New York. And we were hoping to finalize everything up towards the date of that trial. That trial has now been postponed and uh, it has not been rescheduled yet. And there's a tendency in these kind of uh, settlements that they only really finish and get signed as you move close to the next legal action. So uh, so for now, it's sort of a, a bit of a standstill. We still have a positive dialogue working on the practicalities of our donation of products for people who suffer from drug abuse. And uh, I'm optimistic that everybody will see that it's to the better of the American public and Americans suffering from drug abuse that we actually reach an agreement where we can start helping people rather than having hundreds of trials over the next 10 years. One of the big questions, of course, for a company like yours is the pipeline. Uh, what have you got in the pipeline that you, you tell investors about? So right now, the most exciting thing we have in the pipeline is a project we're doing together with Regeneron. It's called Ficinumab. It's a product which will give pain relief to people with arthritis. And uh, it's in phase three trials right now. We expect to get the phase three results uh, within the coming uh, six months. And that's very exciting. And it sort of plays into the problems we have with pain medication, that there's a risk of abuse with pain medication. This will be a biological product that you inject once a month or once every second week, and it will not have any risk of misuse. So uh, we very much hope that it makes it through the phase three, and we'll know that later this year. Carl, one of the things we've seen uh, in the wake of this pandemic have been governments very concerned about their domestic supply of available drugs. Uh, we can imagine that if and when vaccines come into play, that will also be an issue. Do you, are you worried about long-term consequences of drug purchasing, of supply chains, of how governments will treat this whole sector? This is, of course, a very interesting uh, issue, not the least for the United States. It is a fact that during the last 10, 20 years, all production of raw materials and API has left the United States and uh, has basically moved to China and India. 
And uh, you could say now it's a political decision whether you want to secure stability of supplies based on manufacturing in Europe and US or whether you will leave it for manufacturing in China and India. It's really not something we as a company can decide on. We do have a pretty strong manufacturing base in the US with a lot of investments. We also have kept API manufacturing in Europe. But if we are to bring more back to the US and Europe, it will take some political reform in order to do so. Car, your results now showing that generic drug sales in North America fell slightly this time around. So uh, given the COVID-19 pandemic, what sort of outlook do you have for generic pricing and sales? So the COVID-19 is really not affecting the pricing or the sales. I mean, hydroxychloroquine is a very, very cheap product, and we've donated most of it. So we really didn't make any money on the COVID-19 sales as such, and we don't expect to do so in the future. We made it very clear that we are not taking any list price increases in connection with COVID-19. So you should really not see this as a major factor in our sales. The sort of lift in sales we had in the first quarter was really generic medicines and OTC products in Europe. And that was probably a consequence of people getting nervous about lockdown and buying some extra stuff for their medical cabinets. We'll probably see a reversal of that in the, in the second quarter. And there was really no major move in the U.S. in terms of our sales.